This is a lecture on population structure for the University of Maine at Augusta, Introduction to Sociology. Let's take a look at this photograph of New York City in the early 1900s. It comes from a newspaper article that was published by Jennifer Lee uh, in the New York Times in uh, the summer of 2008. And you can tell it's staged. Um, how can you tell? Well, according to Jennifer Lee, at the end of the 1800s, there were 100,000 to 200,000 horses in New York City, and their average output was 22 pounds of manure per horse per day, one quart of urine per horse per day. So you do the math, multiply 22 by 200,000, one quart by 200,000, and you have an idea of exactly how much the streets did not appear the way they do in this photograph, uh, which it appears the streets were cleansed for. Rather, this was a place of filth and disease. Those dead horses were often left to rot in the street. The excrement of the horses uh, stayed in gutters. If it rained, it went into the ocean, but otherwise it might stay there for some time. Uh, pigs ate the excrement, they ate the dead horses, and then they in turn roamed the streets of New York City, and they excreted as well. People also excreted. And where did their filth go? Into the gutters, perhaps, if we were lucky. Otherwise, uh, on the streets, on the sidewalks, um, back into people's systems containing bacteria, containing viruses, containing infection, which leads to early death. New York City at the turn of the 20th century and before was a place where people went to die young. That has something to do with this graph of world population over time, for which uh, we have a span of the x-axis of the history, roughly speaking, of biologically modern human beings. For 99% of this time, uh, human population growth is very, very low. It starts to pick up around, or just before the year zero, as a number of cities and empires grow, which can support human populations. But look at the turn of the 20th century, 1900, and what happens between then and the year 2000 and shortly afterward. It is a period of unparalleled growth. What leads to that? Well, the qualitative explanation has to do with the notion that for 99% of human history, population growth was limited by disease and food scarcity, which killed people off. But by the mid-18th century, and certainly into the 19th century, and most strikingly in the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution and the idea of the Enlightenment, the idea of progress, leads to increases in the standard of living, better food, cleaner water and air, safer housing, uh, sanitation, the development of sewers to take care of excrement, a basic idea that we take for granted now, health care if you do get sick. All of these lead to a decline in the death rate, and that in turn leads to a population explosion. The social scientists called demographers have a central equation that is the basis of most of their work. And that is the idea that population at t plus 1 equals population at t plus natural increase plus net migration. Now that may sound like gobbledygook to you, but what does that all mean, practically speaking? It means if we think of t as what happened at the beginning of last year and through the last year, and t plus 1 is what happens this year. If natural increase is births minus deaths, and net migration is immigration versus minus emigration, what the demographic equation is telling us in words is that the population this year is equal to the population at the beginning of last year, plus all the births that happened last year, minus the deaths, plus all the people that came to our country, minus all the people that left our country. When you express it that way, 
it sounds so simple as to be perhaps obvious, but the demographic equation has uh, a number of consequences that may not be obvious at first blush. And for that reason, it's really important to understand the demographic equation. It tells us why we have a population explosion and why we might begin to expect that population explosion to ameliorate. Under demographic transition theory, there are a number of stages. First of which, second of which, and third of which have already happened for a large majority of the world. In the first stage, pre-industrial populations, there's little population growth because if population in the next year will equal births minus deaths plus immigration minus emigration, well, immigration and emigration from country to country across the whole world will equal zero because if you immigrate to some place, you have to subtract yourself as an emigrate from someplace else. So really across the world, it's all about birth and death. And the fact is that in pre-industrial societies, there was a high birth rate. People had many, many more children than they do now, but most of their children died. In stage two of early industrialization, there continued to be a large population growth, or excuse me, there was a new large population growth as high birth rates continued, but death rates declined due to sanitation, due to the rise of doctors who have modern scientific training, hospitals become places where you actually go uh, to be protected and you aren't fearing, and so on and so forth. Safe food, safe water make death rates decline. In stage three, culture catches up to technology. People continue in stage two to have high birth rates because that's what people have always done. But in stage three, uh, culture catches up and new norms develop in which small families are acceptable. There's some debate in demography about whether we are entering a stage four of post-industrialization in which uh, women enter the workforce, uh, raising children becomes more costly, and cultural values that encourage people not to have children at all uh, lead to lower birth rates than there are death rates. And this means that over time, population declines if there are more deaths than there are births. In pictures, we would expect demographic transitions to look like this. On the left, you have pre-industrial societies in which birth rates and death rates are roughly the same, and they're both high. That means that there's really no change in total population, the line in red. But then the death rate begins to decline. People, because of cultural habits and because they didn't get the memo that death rates were going to be lower, uh, they continue to have more children. And it takes a few generations for people to notice, hey, there are a lot more people. And maybe we don't need to have so many children because they're all tending to live. At that point, only later, after a couple of generations, does the birth rate really begin to plummet. And finally, birth rate equals death rate and population growth comes to an end. Now, there's a feature called population momentum, which is referred to if you're taking my class in one of your readings. And the idea goes like this, that there's continued population increases for a time even after birth rates decline to match death rates. Why? Because when you have a population boom, that means you have a whole lot of children that live to adulthood that, that massively swamp the relatively small number of people in their parents and their grandparents generation. So even if all of those new babies in the baby boom each only have a couple of kids, all of those babies are going to replace themselves and there are going to continue to live after they have children. So they become parents and then the baby boom becomes grandparents and their children have children. And it is 
only after the baby boom begins to die off that you actually begin to have uh, a leveling of population because only at that point are there as many people to die as there are being born. It takes a few generations for population growth to grind to a halt. Now, this is a structure that shows pre-industrial uh, population in which there are many, many young people, but a lot of young people who also die uh, and don't make it to the full flower of adulthood. This is Bangladesh in 1981, a pre-industrial society. And now there are certain advantages to it, despite all the disadvantages of many people dying at a young age of a great amount of disease. If you do make it to the age of 65, look at how little competition you have for the adoration of the young. There aren't that many other people besides you there, and there are many people of working age to support you. This tends to lead to the veneration of the elderly, because such veneration is easy to afford for those uh, many, many more who are of working age, and many, 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 many more who are young. On the other hand, there aren't enough resources to spend a lot on the young, because there are so many young people to take up those resources. As a result, the young cannot be invested in as heavily as the old can be invested in. So a devaluation of the young, a veneration of the old, is one of the features of a bottom-heavy population pyramid society. And this isn't a feature of the unique psychology of a country with a bottom-heavy population pyramid. It simply has to do with how many people there are at different ages. But if you consider a top-heavy population of Japan in 2050, on the other hand, this is a projection, again, of the United States Census Bureau of what Japan will stand to look like. Take a look at the number of old people and compare it to the number of young people. There are many, 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 many more old people. Now, the strong veneration of the elderly in Japan at the beginning of the 21st century, by the middle of the 21st century, cannot be sustained because there simply are not enough people of working age to take their resources and devote them to the old. Who's going to take care of the old? How can the generations of those that are of working age manage it? It's much more easy for those who are working to take care of a very few young people because there aren't that many young people to take up uh, the resources that would be required for a strong educational system. There are many, many, many more people of working age and elderly age who can look after them. So the reverse is possible in a top-heavy population pyramid, or as some people put it, an inverted population pyramid, which is the veneration of the young and a society that ignores its old people. This idea is expressed in demography through the dependency ratio, which is a fraction. The number aged below 15 and above 64 is the numerator on top of the fraction. On the bottom of the fraction is the number uh, of age 15 through 64. It is the number of dependents per working person in a society. And the more dependents there are, the more that those on the bottom in the working ages, the more they're going to have to work, the more they're going to be stretched. And perhaps the harder time an economy is going to have in growing. If you're interested in looking at population pyramids from a number of different countries, please feel free to follow these links. Perhaps the easiest one to follow is populationpyramid.net, which contains a number of interactive population pyramids that you can uh, uh, look at as in any country. Uh, the time frame shifts from the past to the projected future.
And you'll notice that in society after society after society, it is predicted that population pyramids that used to be bottom heavy will start to invert. What can we expect to change for the treatment of the elderly? What can we expect to change for the treatment of the young? Well, let's consider what happened when the United States had a bottom heavy population pyramid. 1930s, and then in the 1940s, when you had a baby boom. And before the 1930s, when you were at the tail end of a period in which you had large families and you expected that some children would die. Very few old people, relatively speaking, compared to today. And you had the ability to actually create posters. This is a poster championing uh, Social Security and begging old people, please sign up. These are, are not young people who are signing up exclusively. They're old people in that picture and middle-aged people in that picture, people who are going to be collecting their checks soon, possibly. And they're saying, please, whatever you do, return your application. The government wanted old people to participate in Social Security. Compare that to today, when people are being asked to possibly delay their Social Security participation. And in the halls of government, people are saying, we cannot pay for Social Security much any longer. Why is that? Because of the dependency ratio. Because in the United States, if you look at the U.S. population pyramid, there are uh, fewer and fewer projected working age people compared to the population of the elderly. Uh, who's going to pay into Social Security? Working age people. Who's going to be taking out their checks? The elderly. That's why there's a worry about bankruptcy. It has to do with social structure, not about psychology. Well, what is one possible solution to this? The often neglected portion of the demographic equation, which has to do with immigration and emigration. Now, it's quite possible that the United States, even if it has a natural population decline in terms of births and deaths, still could have a population increase if young people immigrate to the country, people of working age population. And if you take a look at the decline during the years of the baby boom, when the baby boom was working, the decline in immigration, well, those immigrants weren't needed. We had a large number of baby boomers to work uh, and to sustain economic growth. But in recent decades, you've noticed the percent of the population that's foreign born has gone up and up and up and up. Why is that? Who are those immigrants typically working age? And what do they do? They fill out the bottom of the population pyramid. They keep it from being more inverted. Now you may have uh, politics that supports immigration. You may have politics that opposes immigration. But what's notable here is that immigration serves a social structural purpose. It allows for one solution, one possible solution, to the demographic dilemma of how so few people born in the United States there are to take care of so many elderly. If you bring in people from the outside, that solves the problem, the demographic problem. It may lead to future cultural problems as what the United States is starts to look very different over time.